Well, I want to do something a little different today. Uh, normally, I try to make it through one chapter with competition and all. <laughs> but uh, this time, I'm going to try to. I'm going to attempt two. I'll kind of keep an eye on the clock there. If I go get too long, I'll stop it. And, you know, we can always take up wherever I, I finish. But uh, chapter 14 and 15. Now, re the reason is chapter 14 is uh, fairly short, and uh, chapter 15. Uh, I want to focus more on that. We'll go. We'll probably speed right on through chapter 14. I will have some comments along the way. Some important things are in this chapter. I mean, important things in every chapter, obviously. But uh, chapter 15, that's got to be one of my favorite chapters. I love that that chapter because it is chock full of stuff. Uh, that chapter was uh, very meaningful to me back many years ago when I was in a different church organization. And uh, what they were saying about that chapter and some of the contents of it, particularly about the role of Simon Peter at the Jerusalem Council, uh, it was just not what the, t the chapter itself says. And so that was uh, uh, in part, that was part of the reason I had uh, difficulties with following the line of interpretation that was being given to me and partly why I chose to leave that organization and take up with this one. And uh, But anyway, it, it's, it's all kinds of stuff. Also, it, it, that chapter has to do with uh, the issue of uh, law keeping. Remember, this is when the uh, party of the circumcision, as they're called, said it was necessary to circumcise the Gentile converts and to order them to keep the law of Moses. And I think that statement is very frequently today misinterpreted. And so we'll take a look at that. I want to get into that chapter, but first let's go on through chapter 14 here. Get right into it. Verse 1. Now at Iconium they entered together into the Jewish synagogue. synagogue. This is Paul and Barnabas. And Iconium, by the way, was some 80 miles southeast from Antioch in Pisidia where they had been. We talked about that last time. And so now they are some ways away from Antioch and Pisidia. Remember there are different Antiochs. Antioch in Syria was the starting place. Then they went up into what we call Asia Minor. Uh, what, is, what came to be by the Roman period southern Galatia. And maybe the same peoples that Paul would later write to when he wrote his epistle to the Galatians. But anyway now they're in Iconium. And this, uh, anciently, this was a Phrygian town. Uh, it was uh, under the Greek, during the Greek period. Uh, it was, uh, became a city-state. But then uh, Augustus in about 25 BC, in the Roman period, uh, made it a city in the province of Galatia. So that's why those cities in that region are considered a part of Galatia. They're southern Galatia. So it says uh, that uh, they entered into a Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks, these would be, this would be the God-fearing Greeks, the God-fearing non-Jews who would come there to hear the reading of the Law and the Prophets and hear commentary on it. A great many of them believed, it says. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of His grace, granting, notice it was the Lord who granted these things, it's up to Him when these things occur, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Again, this is all a part of that foundational ministry in laying the foundation for the church. And so here that you see signs and wonders, and, uh, you know, the subject comes up from time to time. We've talked about it before. Uh, do the signs and wonders still happen today? And uh, my answer to that, you know, you have two schools of thought. Some say yes, and we should look for them. We should uh, tarry for them, fast and pray, and try to bring them about. When you start doing that, though, you move into this charismatic mode. And next thing you know, you've got all kinds of things going on, uh, very questionable things. Some things not so questionable is clearly not scriptural. But uh, in, in any case, on the other hand, you have the, the school of thought that says, no, it all ended with the apostolic period. I don't agree with either side. 
I think both are extremes. Uh, yes, there, wa there were special signs and wonders, gifts of the Spirit that were given during the apostolic period to confirm the word of the apostles as they laid the foundation for the church. This movement that began. But that does not mean that once the foundation is laid, that there's no future laying of the foundation, that there's no future work that will need to be accompanied by signs and wonders. So it very well may be that uh, the greatest signs and wonders are yet ahead of us. I can't say one way or the other, but it, what I do know, it's up to God. It's up to Him always. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. This is the unbelieving Jews. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews, here they were plotting together, with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Laconia, and to the surrounding country, these other cities of the town of the Roman province of Galatia. And uh, Laconia is a sub-district uh, into the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. So when they were driven out of one place, what did they do? I don't want any more of this. <laughs> no, no, they went at someplace else. And they continued preaching the gospel there. They kept on this work of uh, laying down the foundation of the church. And of course, continued making disciples in all of these various places, establishing churches. And then later, as we will see later on, they, they went back through and they appointed elders uh, to, for the purpose of overseeing the flocks and keeping things in order and uh, so on. Verse 8, now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. Now this is, this is reminiscent of the story we read in Acts the third chapter. You remember the, uh, the account of the man who sat at the gate called Beautiful? And at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour of the day, as Peter and John were walking by, and uh, he was begging for money, you know, he said, so, and Peter said, uh, I don't have any silver or gold, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. He, you know, get up and walk, and he did. And that had a profound effect. Now, what's going to happen here is very similar to that. It's almost a repetition of the same story, only this time it involves Paul, not Peter. This time it's in a very different culture. The first time, in Acts 3, it's a, this, this was in the midst of a crowd of observant Jews. People who are familiar with the Scriptures, people who, uh, you know, their God was the God of Abraham. So they have, it's a different cultural setting. Here they're in a very pagan place. I want you to see what happens. It's quite interesting. It says, He was crippled from birth and had never walked, just like the man back in Acts 3. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well. Now, again, Luke, as we've mentioned before, Luke summarizes a lot. And this is a summary statement. We don't know. There might have been some conversation between Paul and this man. But somehow or other, Paul knew that he was a man who was believing, believing the message, and exhibiting faith in some way. So he knew he had the faith to be made well and said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet, just like Peter did to the man at the gate beautiful. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices well, it said, first of all, and he sprang up and began walking. Now, again, you remember, we talked about it quite a bit back in Acts 3, how what a profound effect that had on that Jewish crowd, and how that just, just uh, catapulted the message that the apostles were preaching, uh, and resulted in tremendous new growth. As you might well imagine. Now people were poised to believe the message that Jesus really was the Messiah, that he really had risen from the dead, that he had ascended to the right hand of God, where he is exercising all power in heaven and on earth. So they were believing. Now, now they're getting the same message in this very pagan place. And here this man springs up and begins walking, just like the man in Acts 3 did. And when the crowds saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. This is a pagan culture now. It's not, it's not back in Judea. Very different thing happened here. But in one way, similar. Now I want to get, before I read the rest of this, 
uh, it's, uh, it's probably important to realize that there was an ancient legend in that region. Uh, the legend was that a couple of the gods, Zeus, chief of the gods, and Hermes, also known as Mercury, uh, who was uh, one of the chief spokesmen for the gods, uh, he, but they came down to that area and appeared as men, and they were seeking hospitality, and only one couple in all that region gave them the hospitality, invited them in. They welcomed them warmly. And so what Zeus and Hermes did was they turned that couple's house into a great temple with all the pillars and the, the marble and all of that, a, a temple to Zeus. And they destroyed all the rest of the houses in that place, similar to God destroying, the, you know, destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. So that was an ancient legend that was there. Uh, apparently everybody at that time knew it. But here is what it says, read on in verse 12, Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Well, of course, Zeus was uh, the head of the gods. He was over Hermes, so I guess Paul didn't like that much. They thought Barnabas, but <laughs> no. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gate and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. So, you know, when this thing happened, they just were sure this was Zeus and Hermes in their midst, just like they had come down before. This time, though, they didn't want to get their homes destroyed, like their forefathers allegedly did. So here they're bringing out these oxen and these sacrifices. They're going to sacrifice to these two great gods that have come down to them from Mount Olympus. But when the apostles Barnabas, and now this is the first time that uh, the word apostles is applied to someone other than Paul or the Twelve. And uh, here Barnabas is called an apostle. And this is used, I think we've talked about this before, but the word apostle uh, has actually can have a couple of different meanings. If you're talking about the original, the Twelve, they were apostles in a special sense. And Paul was in that special category. They just used the simple name, apostle, meaning one sent. And they were eyewitnesses of the risen Lord. Here, Barnabas is called an apostle. It's used in a more general sense, meaning simply one who is sent. And if you trace back the story, you see that Paul and Barnabas, by direction from the Holy Spirit, were both sent to this place to accomplish this mission, these various missions that they went out on. So Barnabas was, as Paul, one sent. But he wasn't uh, one of the foundational pillars as uh, the other apostles were. Well, so, and, and, and what I was going to mention from that is, uh, so today when people claim to be apostles, I say, okay, in the general sense, maybe. People are sent, you know. I would not say that God doesn't send anybody today. Uh, for a particular ministry to be accomplished. So there are apostles in that sense, but I don't like to go around labeling people an apostle or, you know, sticking these special labels. After a while, that starts to go to people's heads and, you know, it becomes something that uh, wasn't intended to be. But in any case, uh, so yeah, there, are, there could be apostles today in that sense, but no apostles in the sense of one of the original 12 or Paul. We have no eyewitnesses of the resurrection living today. No apostles in that sense. But going on here in verse 14, and, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they, they did what, uh, you see this happening throughout the New Testament. It's uh, something people did when they were either in great distress or grief. They tore their garments. Well, I tell you what, I know some people in grief and distress so often they wouldn't have any garments left if they tore them every time. So they tore their garments. I guess they reach up there and give it a rip, you know, give it a tear. And rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things, the things you're trying to do right here, turn from these idols, turn from these false gods, so turn from these vain things to a living God 
In other words, not these gods that exist only in your imaginations and in these various images that you have around the city. But turn to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and that all is in them. In past generations, and this is interesting, we will see something very similar when we get to Acts the 17th chapter. He says something very simpler, similar when he's talking to the people of the Areopagus, the philosophers, other pagans there on Mars Hill. In past generations, he, that's God, allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Now the implication is here, as it is in Acts chapter 17, as you will see it more clearly there, Paul says, but now, in chapter 17, he says, but now calls all men everywhere to repent. What's the difference between past generations and now? Well, there's one big difference. Now, the gospel is going out by means of the apostle, the apostolic witness. The gospel is going out, and it's through this message that's going out the gospel of the kingdom of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's only the one gospel, it's not a multitude of gospels as some people claim. But that uh, is through that message that God is now calling all men everywhere to repentance. It doesn't mean everybody's heard the message, no, no, but as the message gets to them. So that's the difference between old days, past generations, and what is happening now in the time of the apostles. So he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet, even then, even then, back in those days, he did not leave himself without witness. Now here he's talking about general revelation, not special revelation. You know, the law was given to Israel by means of special revelation. God himself wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger. He spoke the Ten Commandments. He gave them his law. He established his covenant with them. And also uh, the, the new covenant is established. God himself intervened in the history in the person of Jesus. And uh, uh, so the gospel that they are proclaiming is also, is, uh, that the, the, the gospel the apostles proclaim is also in the, ca the category of special revelation. But there's a general revelation given to all men everywhere. And you know what it is? It's the one that I say today leaves the Darwinian evolutionists without excuse. They look at their, you know, you hear their theories and here you have uh, not only the Darwinians, but also the modern physicists. And they tell you how the universe came to be. They admit it had to come to be. It came into existence. And how? Well, just spontaneous creation. You mean it came into existence from nothing? Yeah, that's what they say. Yeah, it did. Came into existence from nothing. Well, what, what do you mean by nothing? Well, it's a, a quantum ripple. Well, wait a minute, that's not nothing because nothing doesn't ripple. You can't get a ripple out of nothing. If it's pure nothing, it's nothing. There's nothing there to ripple, you know. <laughs> but uh, what they're doing, they're redefining, we talked about that before, they redefine the word nothing so that they can try to have creation without a creator. That's what they do. That's exactly what they do. And so they too are without excuse. But here in verse 17, let's just read that and continue. It said, He did not leave himself without a witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. In other words, the witness of creation itself is witness to a creator. And that, if, if you look at the human mind that can look at these things and process these things, he is left without excuse if he does not acknowledge a creator. And there's a certain in, inborn moral law. There's a certain natural law. We see it in all these, even in the various primitive tribes throughout the world that never have been touched by the missionaries. They have, there's a certain universal moral code that exists an objective morality. So this is what Paul is talking about. He also talks about that in Romans chapter 1 and verses 18 through 21. We'll look at that later. We won't take the time to turn over there. And then he goes on, even with these words they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. And they're begging them not to, even tearing their clothes. <laughs> We're serious about this. Please don't. You know, rip. <laughs> and uh, uh, still, they, the people wanted to do it. 
Verse 19, But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Apparently he was just knocked unconscious, uh, but they supposed that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. Now, I want you to look at something in Galatians, the sixth chapter. In Galatians, the sixth chapter, keeping in mind that this epistle, that I've mentioned this before, that uh, but there's controversy, or I should say, uh, uncertainty as to whether the epistle to the Galatians was written to the northern Galatians, which we don't know anything about them, churches in the northern part of Galatia, or to those that are being described right here in these chapters in southern Galatia. And I would say in all probability, the epistle to the Galatians is written to southern Galatians. In other words, these people right here in Lystra and the surrounding cities. But I want you to notice what Paul says to these same Galatians, if indeed they're the same, and I believe they are, in chapter 6 and in verse 17. Let's take up the context, so get a little bit of the context, back up all the way to uh, uh, verse uh, oh, 15. It says, For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. That's what counts. A new creature in Christ, a new creation. And as for all who walk by their, this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. That's the true Israel, not just a physical Israel. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. And they knew it. They'd seen those marks. I'm talking about marks from stoning also from some of the beatings and whippings that he underwent for the name of Jesus, the sake of Jesus. So he bore in his body the marks of Jesus. And he didn't just quit. You know what? I might be tempted. I'll be honest about it. If I'd taken some of the beatings Paul took, if I'd been stoned and left for drug out of the city and left for dead, and if I came around later on, I'd think, I don't know, I want to keep on this job. <laughs> But uh, Paul did. He, he persevered. He went right on. He knew what was right, and he did what was right. He continued preaching the gospel and making disciples and doing what God had commanded him to do. And then uh, verse 21. Well, the latter part of verse 20, the next day he went up and went, went on with Barnabas to Derby. In verse 21, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. You know, here he's risking his life by going back to these areas and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. He could speak, the, he, he could say that, couldn't he? He had the experience of it. So, he, and he's not saying that going through the tribulations is what gets you there, but in the process of our going to the kingdom of God, in the process, in, in the journey, the travel, uh, many tri tribulations lie along the way. We need to be prepared for them and to be able to endure them. And certainly, Paul is a model of endurance. And when they had, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So here they wanted to go back and make sure the churches were stable. They appointed elders. They wanted it to, they're not trying to create a hierarchy of some kind, but what they are doing is making sure that they have stability in the church, that the disciples of Jesus Christ, newly made disciples, now have uh, what they need uh, in their to, 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 to grow in their discipleship. And now then they're... The next few verses, we find them back in Antioch of Syria. This was the starting point. This is the church, Antioch in Syria, that uh, the Holy Spirit revealed that uh, Paul and Barnabas were to be sent on the, this original mission. Now here they are on these other missions. Uh, verse 24, Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed to Antioch where they had been commanded or commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. 
And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. So here they're coming back and they're telling what all God has done through their ministry. And the people there uh, in the church in Antioch, they knew. They knew that the Holy Spirit had sent them on this mission, and they're now seeing the fruit of that mission. And now we come to chapter 15, and this has got all the good stuff in it. <laughs> that one was not too bad there. That had some pretty, pretty good stuff there. But uh, chapter 15, uh, you, you get a little controversy within the church going on. That's always fun, isn't it? <laughs> But a little controversy taking place within the church over a particular issue that came up. One that was absolutely inevitable given the culture clash now that was uh, about to, or was taking place now that you had Gentiles coming into the fold. It started out an entirely Jewish, an observant Jewish church, and now then you had Samaritans. Well, that's okay. They're still kind of off down there to themselves. And uh, you have... Uh, uh, you have now Gentiles, not only the God-fearing Greeks who would come to synagogue, who are already worshipers of the God of Abraham, but now you're having people coming into the church right out of rank paganism. So you've got quite a culture clash going on there, or at least you have the seeds that are being sown for such a clash. Verse, chapter 15, verse 1, But some came, men came down from Judea, and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Notice it's not saying that the, the law of Moses has good instruction for Christians. That's not, the, that's not the argument. Some people like to turn it into an argument like that. That's not, that's not the issue. They're saying, unless these disciples, you guys have been going out and making these disciples from among the Gentiles, if you're not circumcising them according to the custom of Moses, then they can't be saved. Now, later on, we'll get to it, uh, we'll read our way down to it, but I want to turn over to uh, uh, verse 5. This is later when the, at the Jerusalem Council. It says, But some believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees, evidently the same group here, rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Now how many times has this verse, has this verse been used to show that the law has been done away? And it's a, that's not, the, that's not the issue. The issue. The issue, as I said, is not one of whether the law pertains to us, but is one, it is one of salvation. How is one saved? And of course, the, Paul knew as an observant Jew himself, he understood already, as many other Jews did then, and there are Jews today who know it, that the law was never given as a means of salvation. In the time of Moses, it didn't save anybody. Not in a spiritual sense. So, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, let's, let's continue reading. First of all, before I, before I continue, where do you think, or how do you think they came up with an idea like that? And I don't know that all of these people who had that idea initially were bad people. You know, when Paul deals with them in the book of Galatians, by that point, he's pretty direct with them. He, he's some pretty strong words. Uh, double anathemas for those who were preaching a different God. What it amounted to uh, was uh, they were actually abandoning Christ. If you're adding something else, saying Christ's sacrifice is not sufficient, it had come to that place for some of these people. If it's not in itself, in of itself, sufficient as the means of salvation, and that's what it amounted to to teach this other doctrine, that uh, he's not, you gotta, have to, you gotta have this other thing here too, you have to be circumcised, then, uh, then that amounts to nothing less than a false gospel. That's what Paul is saying. But again, how do, they, how do you think they came up with such a, an, an idea as that? Let's go back to Exodus chapter 12, and even though we're past the Passover season this year, let's review just a little bit of it. 
Exodus, Acts, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 12. And let's break into the text in verse, uh, we want to take about, uh, let's see, verse 38. Talking about the Exodus, it says, A mixed multitude also went up with them when they left Egypt, and very many livestock, both flocks and herds. Now what this is saying, what this is telling us, that this mixed multitude, this was other people, uh, some of them were no doubt Egyptians who had married Israelites, uh, some of them were uh, no doubt people from other nations who may be, have been slaves in Egypt. But in any case, whoever they were, we know they were not Israelites. It was a mixed multitude of people. A great number, I get the impression it's a great number, a mixed multitude also went up, which says multitude, that means a lot of people, went up with them. Okay? And then we're told, let's drop on down to uh, <clears throat> verse uh, 43, no doubt. The instruction that you find in the verses here uh, is a, is, reflects back on the fact that a mixed multitude went up with the people of Israel. <clears throat> and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it. You know, you've got a mixed multitude with you. No foreigner shall eat of it. Get that? God commands the Passover, and yet He says that it ain't for everybody. Get that? That's what he says. No foreigner shall eat of it, but every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. Ah. Beginning to sound like something you read over in, uh, say, the book of Acts. <laughs> no foreigner or hired servant may eat of it. Now drop to verse 48. If a stranger shall jo sojourn with you, and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, then he may come near. You see that expression, come near? It's used in Scripture in reference to coming near what? The special presence of God in the tabernacle. That's where sacrifices were brought. He may come near and keep it. Keep in mind that this instruction here, even though it's put in Exodus 12, it's for future Passovers. He has in view here the time when the tabernacle would be in place. Let him come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land. He's not. He's a Gentile. But he is as a native of the land. But no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. You get that? That means that everybody who eats the Passover must be as one who is natural born to the land. You must be circumcised. In other words, he must be grafted in or adopted into the nation of Israel. That's what it means. Nothing less than that. So they goes on to tell us that all the people did as Moses had commanded. So that's, that's the first thing I want to call your attention to. Now I want you to turn with me over to Ezekiel chapter 44, keeping in mind that nobody could partake of the Passover with the Israelites unless that person had, in effect, become an Israelite. Okay? In chapter 44, Ezekiel chapter 44, here we're reading, let me give you a little context. Uh, if you start in chapter, go back all the way to chapter 40 and read your way through. So we won't do that here, but you can do it on your own if you wish. It's, you, this is a vision of the new temple. You know, a lot, of, a lot of Orthodox Jews today are looking for this fulfillment. They think that they believe that this pertains to the future when uh, Israel will be restored. You know, and they say that uh, the Messiah cannot come until Israel repents. Then the Messiah can come. And they don't know who it's going to be, but uh, then he will come when Israel uh, is restored, when the Israel repents. And there, there will come a time when there will be this new temple. And it talks about the temple. It gives you all these details, the east gate and the outer court, the north gate, south gate, inner court. Uh, all of these details in chapter 40, chambers for the priest and the uh, other things. Inner temple is described in chapter 41. And then in chapter 42, the chambers of the temple. And then chapter 43, we read that the glory of the Lord fills the temple. 
And you have a description of the altar from verses 13 on uh, into the chapter there. And in chapter 44, the gate for the prince is described. And we read this in chapter 44 and verse 7, or let's start in uh, verse 6. And say to the rebellious house, to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, O house of Israel, enough of all your abominations. Now he's going to reflect on the abominations that they had committed that resulted in, uh, well, disaster for them. I want you to notice something in particular. In admitting foreigners, uncircumcised in heart and flesh, to be in my sanctuary. Well, wait a minute. You mean... There are certain people God doesn't want in His sanctuary just because they haven't gone through the rite of circumcision? That's exactly right. That's right. No foreigners. Profaning my temple when they offer to me my food, the fat and the blood. So you can't have, you can't have foreigners, uncircumcised ones, going into the temple and offering sacrifices. Same principle you see back in Exodus 12 regarding the Passover. No foreigner is to eat it. It is only for those who are circumcised. In other words, they've entered the co covenant community through the rite of circumcision. And now they're grafted into and a part of the nation of Israel. Those are the ones who can approach the holy place. Those are the ones who can come with sacrifices. Now then, with all that in mind, with all that in mind, look at Jeremiah chapter 31. Very, very familiar scripture. You will recall that uh, this, is, uh, this is a passage that uh, is quoted in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews in particular. And uh, it is applied to the covenant that you and I are under today. Chapter 31, verse 31, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with who? With the Gentiles? With the uncircumcised Greeks? With the house of Israel and the house of Judah? Not like the covenant that I made with the fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. Though I was their husband, declares the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquities, and I will remember their sin no more. Also, this, this, uh, the next section here is important in this regard. It says, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order of the moon and the stars by light for night, or for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. What's the implication here? More than an implication, it's a statement. It said this fixed order is not going to depart. It's there. That means Israel will remain before him as a nation forever. And all this is connected with the establishment of this new covenant. So when you look at all these promises, you look at what is said back there, you see that indeed these were the people God had selected. This was the elect nation. And you see the promises are to the elect nation, to Israel. You don't have these promises given to the Greeks, to the Romans, and all these others, but to the elect nation, to Israel. And the new covenant promise is given to Israel. So I, can, I think I can kind of understand why an observant Jew who's accepted the Messiah, right, recognizes that Jesus is in fact the Messiah, who now would say, listen, if you want to come into covenant relationship, into new covenant relationship with God through the Messiah, then you've got to be one of us. You've got to be grafted into the nation of Israel. Then you can be saved. You kind of see how they could come up with that? I do. On the surface, it seems to make sense. But the problem is, the problem with it is, 
that here you have these apostles sent on missions by the Holy Spirit and they were seeing with their own eyes remember what Peter saw back in Acts chapter 10 he saw the evidence of the Holy Spirit falling upon the household of Cornelius an uncircumcised man meaning what salvation came to his house but he wasn't a Jew and Paul and Barnabas go out on this mission or these missions and what they find there is salvation you see the all that all that happens it's very clear that salvation is coming to them while they are yet uncircumcised in other words what God is doing through the Messiah is not restricted to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah but it's for all the families of the earth and that's why you find in the epistles of Paul, Paul developing that theme over and over in various aspects of it in Romans, in Galatians, and you see it here in the book of Acts as well. So I can see where or how uh, some of the believing Jews in the time of the apostles would have come up with that idea. So there, this is the claim. This is what they're claiming should be done. Back to Acts chapter 15. They say, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. You've got to be one of us first. Then you can be saved because the promises pertain to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Verse 2, and after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elder, elders about this question. Notice they were appointed to go up to Jerusalem. It doesn't say, well, you know, the, the idea here is not that Paul and Barnabas thought, well, you know, maybe we missed something here. We better go check it out with, go to, go to Jerusalem where Peter is and check it out to make sure. He'll give us an infallible decree. <laughs> no, nothing like that. No, Paul and Barnabas, their minds are already made. They already know what God has been doing. And you see as they go along the way, notice here we do get a mention of the Samaritans once again here in verse 3. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles. Did, so did Paul, was Paul in somewhat of a quandary? Was he having, did he have any question in his mind? So wait a minute now, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, these people are not really converted. Why would they be declaring the conversion of the Gentiles as they're going to the council if they weren't sure about it? No, he's not going to find out anything. He's going because they want him to go there and to re resolve this issue for those who don't understand it. That's what's going on here. They're not going to look for some uh, infallible decree from somebody. They already know the answer. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders. And notice that they were sent to discuss it not with one apostle, but with the apostles and the elders together. This was a conciliar situation, not a one man uh, makes the decision. And they declared all that God had done with them. And some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees. Note, these were believers. This is not unbelieving Jews. But believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. So can we now see what this really means? Given the backdrop, do we see what this expression really means? Paul uses, puts it in a different way in some of his epistles. He speaks of being under the law. What, what does it, you know what that expression simply means? It means in order to be in covenant relationship with God, it is necessary to become a Jew. That's what it means. It's not, it does not mean, never did mean, cannot mean that the law has no validity for the Christian. That's just not true. If you, if you conclude that, then you've got to cut out a whole lot of Paul's own text because he upholds the law. He's established the path down with, uh, by which the Christian is to walk. I mean, it's there. And anyone who says, I know this is a common claim out there, 
But there is no distinction between ceremonial laws and moral law. There is clearly a distinction there. We've talked about that in the past. I won't take the time to reiterate it all. But it is very clear in Scripture that there are distinctions. No, there's no chapter that says, this is the moral law, and then lists all the moral law. And now, we have finished with the moral law. We will proceed now with the civil law. And then after that, and now here is the ceremonial law. No, nothing like that in Scripture. In fact, moral, ceremonial, and, and uh, ritual law, or, or I should say civil law, they're, sometimes they're mingled in, this, in one text. That's because they're interrelated. But the, the fact is there are a multitude of Scriptures that show you there is a distinction between ceremonial and moral. I mean, what does he say? Uh, sacrifice I do not want. But repentance... You know, this heart of contrition, that's what it... Because there's a distinction between ceremonial and moral. But in any case, and I won't go on with that any further, but it is clear that when, when one, if you go back again, Exodus 12, like we looked at, and some other scriptures, to, to uh, re receive circumcision in a covenantal sense, like they were talking about here. But to do that means that you enter into an agreement to keep the law in its wholeness as a Jew, meaning including the ceremonial features and, and all the features that really never did pertain to you before. That's what it means. That's why Paul says in the book of Galatians to them, when he's talking to them, he says, don't, don't you know you who receive circumcision for that purpose, for the purpose of salvation, don't you know that you're now obligated to keep the whole law? Meaning, if you fail in one point, hey, your circumcision doesn't count for a thing. So you need to look to another source for your relationship with God. And that source, of course, is Jesus Christ. That's, that's, that's his point there. Verse 6, the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. It's not that they were confused over it. Peter already knew the answer. Paul already knew the answer. It's some of the Pharisees who were believers who didn't have the answer. And after there had, or they were confused on it. And after there had been much debate... Peter stood up and said to them, Now, there's a certain way you could read this, or you could emphasize it, to make it seem like Peter now is making the decision on behalf of the rest. Peter stood up <laughs> and said to them, You know, he rose up now for the final decision. Everybody, you know, he's about to speak. No, no, it, it means he got up because he had something to say. Is a discussion going on. Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God, God made choice. <laughs> you could emphasize that and you come up with the idea. Wow, yes, Peter was God's choice. He had primacy. No, no, no. He's talking about Acts 10. Cornelius, you know the story. God made choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And we examined that when we were in Acts 10 and we saw why. Because Peter, being an observant Jew, and the other Jews who went with him, they needed to see what God was doing. That way there would be no question. It wasn't because he was in charge or he was the first pope or anything like that. But that the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel. And, believe. and that means as Gentiles, not after having first become Jews. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. That was the point right there. That's why Peter was sent to Cornelius. Peter needed to see that. And he made no distinction between us and them having cleansed their hearts by faith. That's a beautiful statement there. No distinction. The Gentiles are co-heirs with Israel, as Paul would say later. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Now I, I interpret this a little differently than the way I used to. 
I used to think that the yoke here that the disciples were unable to bear was the yoke of remission of sins. And of course we can't, we can't bear that yoke either. We can't do that. We can't bring about our, our own remission of sins. We can't, uh, you know, salvation is not by anything we do. It's a gift. It's given to us. But I don't think that's what he means here. I think the yoke he has in mind is the fact that they were yoked. A yoke is simply, you know, to be yoked to a plow. You know, you've got to pull the plow. Well, they were yoked to the law of Moses. Okay? And it was, if you look at the ceremony, you go back and study the ceremonial law, and I'm going to tell you what, it was rigorous, it was difficult, and they never did get it right. And that's why I think Paul, uh, Peter is saying that here. Not it was a bad law, it had its goal, it had its purpose, it had a goal in view. But uh, they, they, he said that neither, you, you want to put this yoke on them, you want to yoke them to the law, in, such, in this way, the way it's yoked to uh, observant Jews. And it's something that, even, that none of us ever have born. Our fathers didn't. You know, they got it wrong over and over and over again. And we, did, we haven't. We keep getting it wrong too. And you're going to yoke it onto these people in the Gentile world coming out of pagan religions and yoke them with this something we never got right and we've been trying to do it for a long, long time. I think that's what he's saying. And of course, the, the end, at the end of the discussion, it is about salvation. This yoke has nothing to do with salvation. That's not what it's about. But we believe that we will be saved. You see, that's the subject. We will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. There's your subject, salvation. Not whether or not the law is valuable as a guide, an instruction to us on how to live. It is. And all the assembly fell silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So they're, the reason they're relating the signs and wonders, no doubt, is to show that, look, what we were doing there was of God. You don't have the signs and wonders accompanying a ministry if that ministry is not of God. So they're showing that we were, what we were doing, what we witnessed ourselves, it's clearly from God. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Now, this is the half-brother of Jesus, this, that James. James replied, and if, you, if anybody was in charge of the meeting, here's the guy right here. It wasn't Peter. I don't know if anybody claimed to be in charge, but it seems pretty clear from things that Paul says in, in uh, the in book of Galatians and what you, the way this is worded here that James is probably the lead elder at Jerusalem at this point. Uh, Peter was certainly not seen as the bishop of Jerusalem any more than Paul was seen as the bishop of Antioch. Uh, Peter and Paul both were apostles. Their mission was not to to be bishops over churches but to go out and plant churches, go out and proclaim the gospel and make disciples. So here you had uh, uh, James, the Lord's half-brother, uh, replied, says, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related, not, not declared, you know, made a declaration that we all must now adhere to. No, no. He's related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, now get this, here he goes to the real source, the infallible source. He says, and with this the words of the prophets agree. So here we've heard from Paul. The council has heard from Paul. They've heard from Peter. And now James is speaking and they're going to hear from the scriptures. So he's saying here, this is by what we see, what we have heard. This is backed by scripture. There's your final authority right there. And he quotes from Amos uh, chapter 9 and verses 11 and 12. I'll, I'll read through it and then I'll offer some commentary on it. It says, After this I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David, or the tabernacle of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I, I will restore it. 
that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Now, this is a little bit, so what does that have to do with the situation, you may wonder? What does that have to do with what's going on here? And some, some commentaries have pointed out that this is a, there's some difficulties with this, a little bit enigmatic, but you, it gets down to the bottom line here. What he's talking about, when he talks about the tent of David, who's David? Well, he was the great king. He's the one to whom the promise was made about a permanent dynasty. Okay? The tent of David has fallen down, and from the point of view of Amos, to whom this prophecy was first given, uh, it had disappeared. It appeared that well, God didn't fulfill his word. The, Davi the Davidic line had come to an end. Well, the Davidic line was still there, but the throne was non-functional, to say the, the least. So this, this prophecy is really about, it's not about a certain tabernacle that will be once again stood up. No, no. A tent, the tent of David. It's, talk, it's, it's kind of in po poetry, but it means the house of David has not come to an end. That the David kingship has not ended. It will be restored. That's what it means to rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. And so it's about, in the whole context in Amos 9, it's about restoration after judgment. Judgment has befallen the people of Israel. But God is saying, restoration will come. Guess who it comes through? A descendant of David. That's right, Jesus Christ. So James recognizes in this scripture that he's saying, God is saying, I will restore the Davidic kingship. And he understands, as the others there understood, that that kingship is restored in Jesus Christ. That's what Messiah means, the anointed one. The one anointed as king over Israel. So Israel's king has been raised. In fact, it, has, it was the, the tent of David had fallen, but now it's been raised again. You see reflections in that of the resurrection of Jesus and the ascension in his place at the right hand of God. Now, it's not saying that there's not a future application. There will be when Christ returns. He brings that all power given to him to this earth and establishes his kingdom here. But the point is here he identifies, he understands that this is about the restoration. All restoration passages ultimately center on the Davidic king prophesied to come, and that is Christ. I will rebuild its ruins, I will restore it, and guess what happens? Guess what happens when that Davidic king shows up? That the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. That means outside of Israel. You see what he's saying here? Not just Israelites. And all the Gentiles are called by my name. That's his main point right there. So what he said, James is saying, he says, look, we've heard from Peter, we've heard from Paul, we've heard this testimony, we know it's true, and the scriptures agree to it, here it is. God will, through the, the raising of the tent of David, as it were, will reach out to the Gentiles. The Gentiles, not make them into Israelites first, but the Gentiles called by his name as Gentiles says to the Lord who makes these things known from of old. So that's, that's the conclusion of the matter right there. The scriptures have spoken. Verse 19, therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols and from porneia, it's translated sexual immorality here, it's a broad term takes in a lot of different things, but uh, porneia, and from, and from uh, what has been strangled, and from blood. Now, then that's it. <laughs> uh, you know, if you look at that, some people say, well, if, if there'd been any other requirement, why did he put it there? Well, you know, think of all he didn't put there. Nothing about honoring your parents. Don't have to do that anymore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can steal now. I can covet. I can bear false witness. No, no. It, did, it wasn't necessary to put all those things in there. 
because those things were known. Those things were known. What he's doing here, now this, is, this might be a little different interpretation than some others may, may have, and, and that's okay. Uh, you know, we can differ. But here, you look at three of these things, things polluted by idols. What he's talking about is eating things sacrificed to idols, as will be pointed out later. And uh, these things that have been strangled and from blood, you go back to the, uh, these things were forbidden from the Israelites. What was the thing about blood? Why, why did uh, the Israelites not have blood pudding? Have you ever had blood pudding, by the way? I can't stand the thought of it, but people do. There's people do all over the world. And, uh, but anyway, uh, people use blood as food. Now, this is my opinion. I don't think that that or the thing strangled, I don't think that those have anything to do with health laws. I don't think it's about health laws. Now the clean and unclean distinctions, you can make a different case there. But here, the blood, the reason the blood was poured out because this was sacrifice related. The sacrifice, you know, it was to, to instill the thought that look, the blood uh, in sacrificial offerings, blood is to be poured on the altar. Okay? So this was, this was a, this was a related to animal sacrifice. So I don't think that these Gentiles who were eating blood and eating things strangled and couldn't, after all, couldn't an Israelite sell some of these things to, to Gentiles <laughs> outside the land? But uh, I don't think that those are moral issues. I think they're related to sacrifice and ritual purity. So what he's saying here, now you see, here's the point, here's the point. You would find the things, things sacrificed to idols were sold in the shambles. And a lot of times you didn't know whether it had been sacrificed or not. And for that reason, some observant Jews wouldn't eat any, any I don't care if it's a good, clean steak from the marketplace because of fear that it might have been offered in an idol's temple. Gentiles went out, you know, said, good, that's more for us. <laughs> So they'd go out and buy it and think nothing of it, just like you going to the, you know, to a place, uh, to a market, and you don't question, well, now, is there a temple back there someplace, you guys? You wouldn't do it, even if there was. You just buy the meat, you know that it's just meat. That's what Paul addresses uh, to the Corinthians. Same thing. He even tells them it's okay to eat it if you do it with a clear conscience, and you're not offending your brother, because after all, it's just meat and the earth is God's and the fullness thereof. You know, he's the one that made it. Idols didn't. But anyway, uh, the, the point here is these, the three of these things, pollutions by idols and things strangled and blood, which you would find very common in the Gentile world, those are things they needed to call attention to because those would be the very things that most likely to cause problems in the church. You know, you don't bring blood pudding to a potluck when you've got Jewish members there. <laughs> you don't bring the roadkill in. <laughs> so, boy, I brung dinner. <laughs> yeah. You don't do that. So these are things, at least three of these things, are things most likely to cause separation or cause difficulties within the church. That's why it was necessary only to name these few things. But there are lots of other requirements. We know that. Lots of other things God expected of these people. Uh, if that were not the case, then why does Paul mention honoring your parents in Ephesians chapter 6? Well, let's, let's go on here. So I want to get through this. Uh, uh, we could stop there and take it up, or I could, I'll, I'll go ahead and, uh, well, not as far along as I'd hope to be by now, but let, let's take a few more verses here anyway. He says, verse 21, For from ancient generations Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Now, I don't think this is saying, I used to think that this meant, uh, well, anything else you can get out of the, out of, uh, the scriptures in the synagogues. But there, all these people didn't have access to synagogues. You know, they would come to that place now where they didn't have access to synagogue. I mean, it was read everywhere. What, what I think this means, I mean, some of the people right out of paganism, I don't think they were going to synagogues at this point. The synagogues where the, the law and the prophets were read. 
But it says, for from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city. Here's the point. Here's the point. These things that are mentioned here, pollutions of idols, sexual immorality or porneo, uh, things that have been strangled, things, but these, these laws relative to these things, and you find them all, by the way, in the Holiness Code, in Scripture, back in the book, book of Leviticus. Uh, these, these things have been known universally all over the world. And so, since they are so widely known, uh, the Gentiles who normally would be eating blood or bringing the blood pudding to, you know, <laughs> potluck or uh, roadkill or whatever the case may be, or may think nothing about eating something sacrificed to idols, uh, this would, could cause offenses for his Jewish brothers and sisters. And so he's saying you need to avoid these things. And, you know, the reason he mentions Moses here is because these things are known all over the place. You can't find a Jew anywhere that doesn't know about these things, in other words. And so, uh, since it's taught everywhere and practiced by the Jews everywhere, then you Gentiles who are now fellowshipping with Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ... You need to be aware of their sensitivities. I think that's what he's saying. Now, the mention of, of porneia is probably, uh, that's something needed to be mentioned because it was so prevalent in that society. So prevalent. And it was associated with idolatry very frequently. So uh, that had to be mentioned as well. But all of them were admonished, both Jew and Gentile were admonished, of course, uh, to, uh, to be modest in all things. But here were the basic things. But again... Again, uh, we read elsewhere. I was, going to, I was hoping maybe we would get over to the actual decree. It's a little worded a little differently, but I'm going to save that for the next time. But in any case, we will see that Paul actually refers to various parts of the law and applies those parts to the Gentiles, things that are not mentioned here in this decree. This was just for uh, purposes of maintaining unity and certain things that needed to be said, but they did, they did not see any reason to give a list of do's and don'ts, a list of laws or anything like that, because the things that they needed were already in place. It was as simple as that. So uh, we'll take it up the next time in verse 22. Uh, which describes and discusses the council's letter to the Gentile believers. You will see the slight rewording of the decree as James presents it, and a rewording, and I think we're going to see why it's slightly reworded. Because you're going to see it's taken, actually taken its commentary on a section of Scripture. And it's how those, that section of Scripture applies to Gentile believers. But we'll see that we'll save that and see it next time.